Hey everyone, today we're diving into the fascinating story of how Islam began to rise as a major force in the world, starting way back in the 7th century. It all kicks off with the Islamic prophet Muhammad, who was born in 570 CE. Despite facing a lot of resistance and even persecution, Muhammad's charisma and reputation for honesty helped him gather a massive following. He didn't just preach a new faith, but he also laid the groundwork for what would eventually become a powerful empire. Now this empire wasn't just built on military might, it was meant to be a humanitarian force with principles of equality and justice at its core. But getting there wasn't easy. After Muhammad's death in 632 CE, his close friend Abu Bakr took over and founded the Rashidun Caliphate, which kept expanding the empire. What started as a small, fragile movement quickly became a dominant power across the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Within just a few decades this empire stretched far beyond Medina, the city where it all began, covering all of Arabia, Iraq, Syria, the Levant, Iran, Egypt, parts of North Africa, and even some islands in the Mediterranean. Even though internal conflicts like the First Islamic Civil War slowed things down for a bit, the expansion continued under the Umayyad dynasty. So, how did it all begin? Muhammad started preaching Islam, a monotheistic faith, in his hometown of Mecca around 610 CE. What really drew people in were his messages of equality, equal rights for women, and the promise of heaven, ideas that were revolutionary at the time. But not everyone was happy about this. The Meccans saw this new faith as a threat to their way of life, especially their social and economic structures. They tried everything to stop it, including persecuting Muhammad and his followers, but it wasn't enough. As things got tougher in Mecca, Muslims decided to migrate to Medina in 621 CE, where they were welcomed and where Muhammad himself arrived in 622 CE with his close friend Abu Bakr. Medina gave Muhammad sovereignty, making him the first ruler of what would eventually become the Islamic Empire. From there, the conflict between Medina and Mecca only grew, until finally, after years of struggle, Mecca fell to Muhammad's forces around 630 CE. This victory triggered a domino effect, with other major Arabian cities quickly falling in line. Even Taif, a city that had once treated Muhammad harshly, surrendered in 631 CE. Opposing forces tried hard to stop this new power, but they were all defeated. For instance, a Jewish confederacy was defeated at the Battle of Kaibar in 628 CE, and a Bedouin confederacy was crushed at the Battle of Hain in 630 CE. By the time Muhammad passed away in 632 CE, he was already ruling over an empire that was just getting started, ready to grow even more under the leaders who followed. But after Prophet Muhammad passed away, the empire he left behind was on the verge of falling apart. Many people wanted to return to the old ways of self-rule. But Abu Bakr, a close companion of Muhammad, stepped up. He declared himself the first caliph, or leader, of the Islamic community, and quickly took control, preventing the empire from crumbling. One of his first moves as caliph was to avenge a previous defeat suffered by Muslim forces at the Battle of Muta. Years earlier, the Byzantine governor of Syria had killed a Muslim envoy, leading the Prophet to send an army to retaliate. But that army was defeated. Determined to correct this, Abu Bakr sent out another force, just as Muhammad had planned. But while this new force was on its mission, chaos erupted back home. Many tribes across the Arabian Peninsula rebelled, thinking this was their chance to break free. Abu Bakr, however, was too clever for them. He took advantage of their disunity, and within a year, crushed the rebellion in what's now known as the Rita Wars. A key figure in this victory was Khalid ibn al-Walid a brilliant Muslim strategist who defeated a major rebel force led by a false prophet named Masilima at the Battle of Al-Yamama in December 632 CE. After this decisive win, the rebellion lost much of its momentum, and by March 633 CE, order was restored across the region. With peace restored, Abu Bakr's position as leader was solidified, 
and he became a hero among his people. But he didn't stop there. He had his eyes set on expanding the empire. To the north and east of Arabia, the Muslim Empire bordered two massive powers, the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire. These two giants were often at each other's throats, draining their resources and oppressing the Arabian tribes caught in the middle. Sensing an opportunity, Abu Bakr decided it was time to strike. During the Rita Wars, an Arab leader named Mutana ibn al-Harita approached Abu Bakr, pointing out the weakness of the Sasanian-controlled region of Iraq. Never one to miss an opportunity, Abu Bakr sent Khalid ibn al-Walid, now a celebrated war hero, to lead a raid into Iraq. Khalid's forces stuck to the western banks of the Euphrates River and achieved significant victories with local tribes joining their ranks. Meanwhile in Syria, Muslim forces were making headway but were soon threatened by a major Byzantine counterattack. To prevent this, Abu Bakr redirected Khalid to the Syrian front, where he solidified Muslim control. Back in Iraq, however, things took a turn when the Muslim commander Abu Ubad al thaqafi against Mutana's advice, engaged a strong Sasanian force at the Battle of the Bridge in October 634 CE. The battle ended in disaster, with Abu Ubad losing his life though Mutana managed to lead an organized retreat and held the line until reinforcements arrived from Medina. As this was happening, Abu Bakr passed away in 634 CE, and Umar ibn al-Khattab took over as the second caliph. Umar quickly reinforced the front in Iraq, sending fresh troops under the command of Sa'id ibn Abi Wakrakis, one of the Prophet's trusted companions. The Sasanians, desperate to regain control of Iraq, sent their top general, Rustam Farakzad, to lead a counteroffensive. In 636 CE, the two forces met at the Battle of Al-Qadiziyah. The Muslims were outnumbered and outgunned, but their skill in close combat turned the tide. During the battle, a sandstorm allowed some Muslim cavalry to sneak behind enemy lines and kill Rustam. With their leader dead, the Sasanian forces lost heart and were utterly defeated. This victory shattered Sasanian control over Iraq, and soon after, Muslim forces captured Tesaphon, the Persian capital. The last Sasanian king, Yazdegerd III, tried to muster one last stand, but his massive army was also defeated at the Battle of Nahavand in 642 CE. Despite this, Caliph Umar wisely chose to consolidate his gains rather than push further into Iran. But even with this caution, the victory at Nahavan brought enormous wealth to Medina. However, it also brought tragedy. In 644 CE, Umar was assassinated by a Persian slave, avenging the fall of his empire. Umar's successor, Uthman, continued expanding the empire. Yazdegerd III, who had fled to the eastern part of his kingdom, was eventually betrayed and killed in 651 CE, marking the end of the Sasanian Empire. By the time Uthman's reign ended, the Rashidun Empire had stretched all the way to Sindh in modern-day Pakistan, and the last remnants of the Sasanian lands were under Muslim control. And now let's dive right into the next chapter, the invasion of Syria and the Levant. After securing the Arabian Peninsula, Abu Bakr set his sights on the Byzantine-controlled regions of Syria and the Levant. He sent four divisions under the command of Shurabil ibn Hassana, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, Amr ibn Alas, and Abu Ubaidah. These commanders were given strict orders, avoid direct confrontation with the Byzantine army and don't attack any major cities or fortresses. At first these raids went well, but it wasn't long before the Byzantine emperor Heraclius, though old and ailing, organized a large force led by his brother Theodore to counter the Muslim advances. Sensing the need for reinforcements, Abu Bakr called on Khalid ibn al-Walid, the undefeated general. Khalid, ever the tactician, chose to take a daring route through the desert to reach Syria, using camels as makeshift water tanks. This bold move allowed him to unite the four divisions and face the Byzantine army head-on. In 634 CE, they met at the Battle of Ajnadin, where Khalid's forces secured a crucial victory. When Umar took over as caliph, 
he made the surprising decision to replace Khalid with Abu Ubaida as the commander, likely to assert more control over the campaign. Despite this, the Muslim forces continued their advance, capturing Damascus later that year, either through direct assault or possibly by negotiating a surrender. The momentum didn't stop there. They went on to defeat the Byzantine forces at the Battle of Fall in 635 CE and captured Amisa, now modern-day homes, in 636 CE. This brought them dangerously close to Aleppo and Antioch, where Emperor Heraclius himself was staying. Furious at Theodore's failure, Heraclius dismissed him and sent another large army under Vahan of Armenia to face the Muslim forces. Khalid, though no longer officially in charge, was called upon again due to his unmatched skill in battle. He led the Muslim forces southward, beyond the Yarmouk River, where they prepared for the decisive Battle of Yarmouk in August 636 CE. The battle lasted six intense days, with the Muslim forces initially on the defensive. But on the morning of August 20th, Khalid launched a bold counterattack, using his cavalry to outmaneuver and surround the Byzantine troops. The Byzantine army was thrown into chaos, suffering heavy casualties, and their commander was likely killed in the fight. This victory allowed the Muslims to sweep through Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. With the Byzantines effectively giving up on the region, some of the victorious Muslim troops were sent to reinforce the ongoing campaigns in Iraq. In 637 CE, the holy city of Jerusalem was besieged and, after negotiations, surrendered peacefully to Caliph Umar himself. The city came under Muslim control without bloodshed, and the Jewish population, exiled by the Romans centuries earlier, was allowed to return. Soon after, Umar officially removed Khalid from his position, possibly due to personal reasons or controversy surrounding the general. Before his dismissal, Khalid had also led raids into Anatolia and Armenia in 638 CE. He passed away in 642 CE and was buried in Amisa. Meanwhile, Abu Ubaida, who had been appointed governor of Syria, died in 639 CE during a plague that devastated the region. He was replaced by Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, a former Meccan aristocrat from the Umuwa clan who had converted to Islam. Muawiyah quickly solidified Muslim control over the region and later, during Caliph Uthman's reign, led the conquest of all of Armenia between 653 and 655 CE. With Syria and the Levant under control, the focus shifted to Egypt and North Africa. Amr ibn Alas, one of the commanders who had originally been sent to the Byzantine front, approached Caliph Umar with a bold proposition to invade Egypt. At the time, Egypt was under Byzantine rule, but the people there suffered under oppressive policies, just like those in Syria and the Levant. Emmer argued that an invasion would face little resistance and could prevent future Byzantine threats to the north. Although Umar was hesitant at first, Emmer's persistence paid off. Reinforced by Zubair ibn al-Awam, Emmer led his forces into Egypt and secured a decisive victory against the Byzantine army at the Battle of Heliopolis in 640 CE. Within two years, most of Egypt had fallen to the Rashidun army. Even when the Byzantines launched a major counterattack in Alexandria in 646 CE, they were defeated, thanks in part to the local population who had no loyalty to their former rulers. The Rashidun forces didn't stop there. They pushed further west along the North African coast, defeating the Byzantines at the Battle of Sufatula in 647 CE, extending their control beyond Tripoli. And now, let's talk about the Rashidun Caliphate's conquests on land, but what about their ventures at sea? That's where the story gets even more interesting. And the Rashidun Caliphate, known for its rapid expansion on land, soon realized that if they wanted to solidify their dominance, they needed to control the seas too. And who better to take on that challenge than the skilled shipbuilders and sailors from Syria? These guys were masters at crafting ships, and they put their talents to work, creating a powerful fleet that would challenge Byzantine supremacy in the Mediterranean. The Muslims didn't waste any time after assembling their fleet. 
In 646 CE, they defeated a Byzantine attempt to retake Alexandria, a crucial port city, but they didn't stop there, they decided to take the fight to the Byzantines. In 649 CE, they launched an assault on Cyprus, successfully bringing the island under their control. Then, in 654 CE, they captured Rhodes, continuing their march across the Mediterranean. But the real game-changer came in 655 CE at the Battle of the Masts. This was a major naval showdown between the Rashidun fleet and the Byzantine navy. The Muslims emerged victorious, effectively breaking Byzantine naval power in the region. With that, the Mediterranean was pretty much theirs to roam. They even sent raiding parties as far as Crete and Sicily, making it clear that they were now a force to be reckoned with on both land and sea. And at the height of its power, the Rashidun Caliphate stretched from parts of North Africa all the way to modern-day Pakistan in the east. They didn't just stop with continental conquests, they also brought several Mediterranean islands under their control. The Rashidun Caliphate had become a dominant force in the region, shaping the course of history with their military and naval prowess. But this period of rapid expansion came to an abrupt halt in 656 CE with the assassination of Caliph Uthman by rebellious soldiers. His death plunged the caliphate into a chaotic period known as the First Fitna, a civil war that would last until 661 CE. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Uthman's successor, spent his entire reign trying to restore order, but he too was assassinated by a radical faction called the Kharijids in 661 CE. With Ali's death, the caliphate's power shifted to Muawiyah, the governor of Syria and Ali's rival, who established the Umayyad dynasty. The Umayyads eventually resumed the conquests, but the unity and momentum of the early Rashidun period were never quite the same. Now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. The Byzantines and Sasanians were the superpowers of their time, locked in a seemingly endless struggle. Years of warfare had drained their resources and weakened their empires. The Arabs, on the other hand, had been viewed as a collection of disunited desert tribes, not much of a threat to anyone. But once they united under Islam, everything changed. The Arab armies, now driven by a powerful sense of purpose and faith, began to direct their energies outward. They viewed their wars not just as territorial conquests, but as a holy struggle, a jihad. For them, death in battle was a guarantee of eternal martyrdom, a level of commitment and resolve that their opponents, who often relied on mercenaries, simply couldn't match. These mercenaries, after all, were fighting for money, not for a cause they believed in. Moreover, the Byzantine and Sasanian empires, vast and multi-ethnic as they were, suffered from internal divisions and oppressive policies. When the Rashidun army swept through their provinces, many local populations saw the Muslims as liberators rather than invaders. They welcomed the Arabs, sometimes even joining their ranks or supporting them in other ways. And let's not forget the remarkable military leadership that played a crucial role in these conquests. Leaders like Khalid ibn al-Walid were instrumental in the early Muslim victories. Their tactical brilliance, combined with the fervor of their troops and the strategic missteps of their enemies, ensured the success of the early Islamic expansion. So, in the end, it wasn't just the strength of the Arab armies or the weaknesses of their enemies that led to their success. It was a combination of faith, leadership, and timing. Factors that came together in a way that would reshape the world. 